So, um, hello everyone. We are very happy to be here and pleased to be here at the Dataperk Summit. Um, I hope you have enjoyed all the sessions so far and uh, I hope we are going to present something very useful for you. We are going to talk about actually how to build a large-scale adaptive recommendation engine for Apache, uh, Spark, and Flink. I'm here with my colleague, Gabor Herman. My name is Zoltan Zora, and um, before we go any further, let us introduce ourselves. So we have came from Hungary, from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Institute for Computer Science and Control. And there we have an informatics laboratory, and there we be belong to the so-called data, uh, Big Data Momentum Research Group. And what you might have guessed from the title of this talk, we work closely and jointly with one of our other research group, which is the data mining and search group. Uh, and as a research institute and group, we have very strong uh, ties to the inter industry. We work uh, and contribute um, to the open source community. We work uh, alongside with uh, companies from all around the world. Uh, for example, Ericsson, Rovio, Portugal, Portugal Telecom. Um, a few words about, about our agenda. We are going to talk briefly about the recommendation systems. We are going to show you a very nice tool that we are going to uh, use here, which is the matrix factorization. We are going to show you that um, what algorithms are we going to use, how they can be solved single core using batch or online <laughs> algorithms. Then we are going to deep dive into the problem of uh, matrix factorization distributedly. We are going to show you the online algorithm and we are going to show you our adaptive um, solution, which is the combination of batch and online learning. Afterwards, of course, we are going to show you the solutions in Apache Spark and Flink, and then we are going to close our talk with the conclusions. Now, um, a lot of very nice points have been made uh, yesterday during the keynote talks, um, and, and one of the, the key, key points here is that many companies realize that it is not only useful for them to provide good recommendations for their content and, and for the users, but it has become essential to actually provide good recommendations. And, and, and this is, um, this is um, strongly true for those providers who are or who belong to the entertainment world. Um, in this space, we can basically take two broad uh, set of methods. Uh, one is the collaborative filtering method and the other is the content-based filtering. Now what we usually do with the content-based filtering is that we are going to profile items like profiles that you would uh, see from when you go online on the IMDB that you have uh, a broad set of attributes for each items. And then what we do here is that uh, we are going to look into the movies, for example, or in this example to the articles, and if we found that there are a lot of different articles that are similar to each other which haven't been seen by some users, then we are going to recommend those items to, to, to the given user. Um, there are, of course, other methods like the collaborative filtering where instead of having um, the set of attributes defined by human interaction, like, of course, when you have an IMDB profile, it is going to be um, defined by, 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 by human input. Instead, we would like to profile items and users the same way, but of course, algorithmically. Now, this is the high-level approach or differences between the two techniques. And um, the nice thing about the collaborative filtering method is that, of course, it is going to find a similarity between users. Of course, it is essential not only to you know provide recommendation from your friends because you might uh, you might like your friend but 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 I'm pretty sure that most of your friends are on a different taste. So what this algorithm is going to help you, or how it is going to help you, it is going to find similar uh, tastes 
from all around the world from 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 the from the uh, set of users and um, if we see something like um, some content has been seen or or uh, frequently used or consumed by both users um, we are going to cross recommend those items between with, between the users now um, of course we are going to look into these collaborative filtering methods and there basically we have two main methods one is the neighboring method and the other one is the latent factor model and we are going to build latent factor models here now um, how would you actually do the, the so-called matrix factorization that we are going to use here? Basically, what you can consider or have is that you are going to, you know, collect all the ratings because uh, we have something like uh, a rating or a feedback system uh, in our service. Of course, users are going to explicitly rate items. We are going to collect these ratings into a huge matrix where each row is going to represent a user, and each column is going to represent a movie in this case. Now, um, what you're trying to do here is that instead of uh, profiling items uh, by human interaction, we're going to profile users and items as well in these so-called user vectors and item vectors, algorithmically. Now, um, these um, um, profiles or or genes are so-called latent factors, and some of them might have any useful meaning, like uh, the algorithm would extract the level of action or level of drama out uh, from the ratings for each movie, but there might be some X factor which, make, which, which doesn't make any sense. But we are really not considered about this as for the item vectors. And as for the user vectors, if you see that uh, the, the dimensionality is the same, as, and as for the user vectors, each component in the user vector is going to emphasize the, the level of which um, the corresponding item component or latent factor is important for that user. So if you look into the user vector for Zoltan, there we see that um, the level of action has a score of five for uh, Zoltan, so it means that Zoltan usually likes action, so Zoltan is going to decide based on the action. On the other hand, uh, if you look into Gabor, Gabor uh, really doesn't care about the X, X factor or he is going to avoid this X factor uh, that is there in the movies. Now what we're going to do is that we are going to set the matrix. Um, of course, we have the matrix. We are going to set the user vectors and item vectors to some random. Then we are going to iteratively update the users and the user and the item vectors until we were able to approximate the actual uh, rating matrix. Of course, we are going to do this until we have reached some convergence. For that, we are going to define the loss function. And as you can see, this, last, uh, uh, this uh, function can be uh, very uh, complex. We can um, add something like, um, you know, users are going to create uh, explicit ratings, but you can infer the ratings based on whether the user actually saw the movie like twice or, 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 or four times. Uh, but the user, user actually forgot to, to rate the movie. So if that happens, you might infer that the user should have rated the movie five stars. Or there are some other com um, components, like um, we know that there is some user and item bias, which means for users, for example, uh, that uh, the user taste change over time. Um, so let's see, um, let's say that we were able to approximate this matrix and then we were able to fill out everything. As you, as you see, there might be some zero elements there, so this uh, matrix is actually very sparse at the start. Uh, this is usually a problem, of course, but, but we can handle it. And let's say that we would like to approximate or guess how Gabor likes interstellar. What you're going to do is we take the 
corresponding user and item vectors, we are going to do the multiplication and then we are going to have the rating. So this is the, the, the high level idea. Now that you can ask, okay, but how do we actually execute this algorithm in batch? Of course, you are going to have your items, um, sorry, your ratings persisted somewhere. You are going to read them up. You are going to take the ratings iteratively, up, upgrade or update the user vectors, item vectors, and there you go. Now, as for the online part, instead of having all the ratings persisted stationary, you are going to read from a stream, you are going to put the corresponding rating into its place, you are going to update the user vector and the item vectors. Of course, there are, uh, the user vectors and item vectors have some, some, some st uh, initial state there, uh, and then you are going to take the next item. Now, very important thing that one of our colleagues have learned um, as from these measurements, um, as these measurements suggest that when we learn from online uh, or using online algorithms, is that we might be able to adapt quickly to changes in the data. But when we use batch learning, we will be able, we will be able to provide a more accurate recommendation. But the more interesting thing is that um, as these measurements suggest that if we combine batch and online, we will be able to take the grade from, from both words. So we will be able to adapt quickly uh, to changes in the data, and we will be able to keep uh, an accurate uh, recommendation. Now, okay, but you could ask, okay, but how do we scale these single core algorithms? Uh, since there are, of course, a lot of stories where we see that data volume and velocity is a huge uh, thing. So, for example, Spotify streamed uh, 20 billion hours of music in 2015. YouTube has over a billion of users, billions of videos um, viewed every day. Now, of course, it is evident that we are going to use some form of a distributed data processing engine. But since we would like to create an adaptive solution, we are going to mix batch and stream as well. Of course, you could ask, but what data processing engine is going to provide that if we would like to do it under the same hood? And of course, there are a lot of uh, different approaches. And we have took uh, the, the two most prominent uh, solutions there. One is Apache Spark, an inherently batch engine, which is going to provide you uh, easy for tolerance, straggler mitigation. Because of the mini batch model, you would, be, you would be able to mess around with the generated director, the cyclic graph, and so on. And on the other hand, there is Apache Flink, a continuous operator model, where you might be able to provide a much lower latency. And of course, since um, Apache Flink provides you a, a nice set of tools like uh, adaptive engine where you can trade off latency to throughput. It might be more suitable to mixed use cases. We are going to see. This is something that Gabor is going to tell you in the upcoming slides. Okay. Thanks, Zoltan. Hi, everybody. Uh, okay, Zoltan has already told you about matrix factorization and how can we do an online and batch training and how we should combine these two. What I'm going to talk about is online training uh, and combining online and batch training. And I'm not going to touch batch training because that's something uh, Spark and Flink already provides in their machine learning libraries. So what's more interesting to us is the online learning and the combination of those. So how could we do online learning in a distributed way? So Zoltan has already told you that online learning is something like taking the ratings one by one and doing updates to the item vector and the, and the user vector. So one, when one rating comes in, uh, if uh, we are doing this in a distributed fashion, our user vectors and item vectors are distributed. So 
it might be the case that the corresponding user vector and item vector for one rating is on a completely different machine. So in order to apply this update, we need to bring those to one place. We need to collocate them. When we collocated them, we can just compute the update and send back the updates. So what's the problem with this? If I would like to scale up and do this training in parallel, in a distributed way, uh, then there can be problems when I would like to, to process two ratings uh, simultaneously, for example, for the same item. Like if Zoltan and Gabor has rated Rogue One simultaneously, then uh, I need to somehow figure out in which order I do the updates of these vectors. So I can maybe lock the vector for Rogue One or I can do some other tricks. And this is uh, something like a concurrent modification problem which has been studied, and, uh, and this kind of problem with the online training has uh, come up before. So there is a similar problem with, uh, with a different matrix factorization or batch matrix factorization algorithm uh, called Stastic Gradient Descent, and there has been proposed an algorithm by Gamula for this distributed matrix factorization with uh, Stastic Gradient Descent, and, and it, but what it does, it basically tries to avoid these concurrent modifications by uh, cleverly partitioning the data and, uh, and just avoid it. Okay, so we see that we have problems with distributed matrix factorization, but how can we do, we do something like this in practice? So how could we do it in, in Spark? So first, we have our ratings. Uh, the ratings come in a, in a stream, in a day stream in Spark. And we would like to have an output of updates, for example, so a stream of updates, either an update of, for a user vector or an item vector. And that's, that's, that's okay for now, but how can we compute this update? So uh, we need to somehow store these user vectors and item vectors uh, as some kind of state, and we update this state. So the if we know Spark, or if we know Spark streaming, the first thing that comes to our mind is, should we use update state by key? Can we just use that? The problem is we cannot re really use that because uh, we have to update the user vector and the item vector simultaneously. We need both vectors to compute the update and we need to apply those updates. So we need to use two keys there, and we cannot uh, update two keys simultaneously with the update state by key. So what can we do? Fortunately, uh, as I told you so, there is a batch algorithm solving the same problem, and in Spark we could use batch algorithms in streaming. That's one really nice feature about Spark streaming. Uh, so we can just use the batch distributed as GD for the online updates too. Uh, and actually, there has been a discussion issue uh, and, uh, as a Spark issue, and if you, for, for other directions to speed up or a streaming mat matrix factorization, and if you'd like to look into that, just go and search for that. Okay, so in order to do this, uh, use a batch algorithm for streaming, we need to somehow represent our vectors. So we can represent our vectors with RDBs, like this is the uh, Spark data set uh, abstraction RDD. And if we would like to do batch uh, programs on streaming, uh, we have to use the transform function, and that's okay. And as you see, the transform function has as its input an RDD. So, so now we have a stationary uh, data set RDD of ratings, and we can just uh, compute or we can just apply a batch training algorithm on that and we have our updates. Okay, but here comes the tricky part. How can we apply our updates? So uh, the problem is everybody knows that Spark RDDs are immutable. We cannot change them. And we somehow want to change those vectors, change those matrices. Uh, so what we do is just simply store the references to the RDDs compute the next RDD, the next 
state of the vectors from the previous one and just change the reference to it. And that's why we, I, and I marked it or emphasized it, that's why we used vars and variables and not vars, not immutable, Scala vars for storing the RDDs. Okay, so this is a nice trick, but of course we need to pay attention some de to, the, to some details if we do that because, uh, because that's tricky. So for example, you need to take care about caching these users and items RDD because if you don't cache them, then Spark is going to recompute uh, all them and at the, when you are at the 10th mini-batch uh, interval or you are way into this computation, then Spark is going to recompute all the previous uh, updates, so that's not good. So you need to use caching for that. But there are some other issues. So even if you use caching, uh, we noticed first that the performance of our online updates uh, decreased over time. And we realized that this is because Spark not only, uh, not only tries to recompute the RDDs, uh, if the RDDs are cached, then Spark's not going to recompute it, but it also tracks a lineage graph of all the previous computations. And uh, actually tracking this lineage graph, uh, if the lineage graph gets really long, it, it has an overhead and it decreases performance. So what we can do is just uh, use checkpointing and, and that's some, something like cutting the lineage graph and then Spark's not going to uh, track all the lineage graph all the way back. So if you do that, then the performance is fine. Okay, so let's go to a completely different world. Uh, in Flink, uh, we don't have many bad jobs. We cannot use batch training on, on streaming data, but we have long running operators, long running distributed operators that can hold some state, some mutable state, and we can use these operators to compute and update these states. So we, have, we could have uh, uh, operators for user vectors and item vectors. The question is how can we connect them? Typically, in a streaming data flow system like Flink, uh, we have the data flowing in one direction. Uh, but, and as we've seen in, in the online matrix factorization, Example, we need to do some kind of collocation and update back, so we need some kind of two-way communication. Fortunately, Flink provides a primitive for that, and we can have a loop and a backward edge in the data flow, and we can use that to apply the updates. Okay, so how should it work in practice? So we can get a rating event that's coming in. We can push it to the corresponding user vector, we can take the current state of the user vector there and send it to the corresponding item vector. And now we have all what we need in one place. And we can add the item vector, we can apply the update and update the item vector uh, in place where the item vector is. But we need to do one more thing, we need to send back the updated uh, user vector. And that's it. Uh, that's really cool, but uh, I must warn you with one thing. This kind of loop in the data flow or loops API iterative streams is not really mature enough in Flink, but there are some smart guys working on it to get it stable and get it fault around and so on. So I expect it to be mature and to, uh, to be able to use in production in, in the next few releases of Flink. Okay, so how does Spark and Flink compare in this, uh, in this distributed online matrix factorization? So we realized, and this is something that we actually expected, that Flink performs a bit better uh, at online training. So in, the, in this, in this uh, plot we can see that, that the latency of the updates, latency for one update uh, is, way below five seconds, whereas for Spark, the processing time of the same amount of data, the same load of data, takes more time, like 50 or 60 seconds. So Flink performs a bit better, but that's actually not a surprise because in Spark, we've used a batch algorithm actually for online uh, 
training. Okay, so we've done with uh, online training. How can we combine online and batch? In Spark, this is really easy. We can just do the batch training in the st streaming, uh, just as we, we've seen. We just have to uh, collect all the ratings and do an iterative training on them, not just an online update. And that, as you can see on this graph, if you do that, then uh, the processing time of your mini batch jobs will sometimes get a spike when you do the batch training and you have some scheduling delay due to that, but the processing can go back to normal. And actually you could do a lot of tricks there, but this is easy to implement and could be used in practice. So what about Flink? The problem with Flink is that the batch API and the streaming API in Flink is not really interconnectable. So uh, right now you could only do it with an external system. But Flink says, uh, or the I, I, I think that one of the philosophical ideas of Flink is let's, let's just use streaming for everything. We can use streaming for even batch. And the funny thing is it's possible and it's, and it's feasible and we can use the streaming API for batch training uh, matrix factorization. And uh, I, I've implemented an algorithm by Sebastian Schelter uh, for an asynchronous training and what I realized that this implementation in the streaming API works even faster than uh, uh, distributed gradient descent implementation in the batch API. So that's really cool and if we can do batch in the streaming API, then so we have the batch training in the streaming API and the online training in the st streaming API, we can combine those in the streaming API and share the matrices in, the, in a common state. So, and we did it uh, with a parameter server approach, and uh, I'm not going to going into detail of parameter server because that would deserve another talk, but uh, that's, that's some ideas. Okay, so what, what did we learn from all this? So first, uh, the implementation we think was a little bit tricky because we could we use simply the, we, could, the, we could easily combine the batch and online training in Spark and we could use batch algorithm for online training. But Flink allowed more finer grade updates so we, we, we could just update rating by rating. We didn't have to deal with uh, the limitations of mini batch. But of course we've used tools that are not really mature so uh, the loops API, what we've used is, I guess, one of the few parts that are not yet mature uh, in Flink. So, but we've seen the performance graph and Flink, Flink performed uh, quite well on online training. Uh, another thing what could be important is handling data skew. So we've seen that Flink has long running operators. And if you're training machine learning, dealing with data skew could be really important and if you have stagglers that process the uh, data a bit slower fashion, then, then you need to eliminate them. And in Flink, it's a bit trickier to do because you have long running operators with mutable state. And there are engineering efforts to uh, deal with this, but currently it's easier to change the partitioning or, uh, or change the handling, handling stagglers in, in a Spark where you have short mini batch tasks. Okay, and finally, but not least, well, what, what, what is with machine learning? So, so Flink has a non-complete machine learning library that's, that's not really mature, but there are other, uh, other efforts for doing machine learning in Flink, and, uh, and the community is, is trying to focus right now on, on machine learning. But on the other side, we have Spark ML Lib, which I have, I, I, I guess most of us know, and it's used in practice and it's used in production. So, so we have that. Okay, so to conclude, I would say that Flink is a cool uh, framework and, and uh, it's, it, it has a lot of potentials, especially for online training. So for, and, but Spark is a bit more Mature. So I would suggest if you'd like to do something like 
uh, online machine learning and online matrix factorization I w and, and you have not experienced with this framework, I would suggest you, you to try Flink. But on the other side, if you already invested in Spark and you have already have engineers that, uh, that you already know Spark and you've already used Spark streaming that, then Spark, using Spark streaming and Spark for the online training could be also a good choice. Okay, so thanks for your attention and uh, our experiments, you can find our code for the experiments at my GitHub page and we are happy to receive questions and uh, we'll be around so if you have something to discuss just come and sing. Okay, thanks. Yes? Yeah, so I was wondering, uh, I'm only familiar with, uh, for example, automated use of squares to compute the uh, item uh, matrix and the unit matrix. Now, if I understand it correctly, it seems in your presentation that computing the item vector is independent from all the other item vectors. Is that correct? Is it an option? No, no, that. Uh, that's not. Uh, that's a good question, but actually, but but it's not uh, not really independent. It's just that in an online algorithm, what what we talked about, we can just uh, apply an update, but there's going to be another update and another update on those user vectors. So these are not independent in that training too. It's just another way to minimize the error on the matrix factorization, actually. And, and actually, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's really nice in these, these other ways and then other algorithms like distributed stochastic gradient descent is ALS is not really incremental or not really suitable for streaming. And that's, that's what actually the Spark guys have been discussing on this issue that I've linked, that uh, how, how can they uh, achieve an incremental or streaming ALS, but actually the algorithm is not really suitable for that. Okay, okay thanks. Sure. Uh, dis distributed stochastic gradient descent. Uh, I guess the uh, slides will be uploaded there, but I can just go back if you like. So for, for, for the batch matrix factorization, it's a uh, Okay, so um, if there are no other questions, we are going to be around, so just uh, feel free to uh, come to ask. Of course, you can uh, reach, uh, reach us um, on email or, or whatever um, media you would like. So uh, thank you again. <laughs>